thank you very much, Carolina, for the introduction. And uh, I think this is a good occasion to thank the Harris School more generally for for everything during this visit. It has been great. Above all, Alex and Becca have made everything work perfectly, not just today, but in general. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I, this is the third talk I give during my stay at Harris. And it's one I've been particularly looking forward to because I'm not going to be focusing on one paper, discussing all the technicalities of what we have to go through to make sure that our results hold and so on. I'm going to take a much bigger picture approach to try to summarize some of the things that I, that I think I've learned from a number of different research projects that I've done. Many of them, you will see an overwhelming uh, proportion of them with people from Harris, in particular a uh, number of projects are with Professor James Robinson uh, and with Carlos Molina, who's also now at Harris. So you'll see that and I have to thank them and as well as many other co-authors from work that I've done together with them and I've been drawing from that, from that work. So let me just start with some numbers from a conflict ridden country. The country I'm talking about, everybody knows, is Colombia, a country of about 48 million people that over the last 30 years or so has had almost 8 million direct victims from the conflict. Nearly 160,000 people are estimated to have disappeared. The victims of land mines total close to 11,000. It's believed that close to 6.9 people have been forcefully displaced and about 10,000 losing their lands in the process. And the miners that have been recruited are estimated in close to 8,000. So you would think that a country that suffers this much from violence and conflict would try really hard to solve it. And what I'm going to argue today is that not necessarily. There are many reasons why several politically relevant sectors in Colombia encouraged, embraced, or at least did little to change this violence. And I'm going to explore some of those reasons today. And I'm going to, as I said, draw from a number of different research projects. They are mostly mine, although I'm going to refer to some work of other, of other people, and they are mostly about Colombia. But one message that I want to convey, although most of what I'm, go I'm going to be discussing is going to be about uh, Colombia, I think many of the general insights that I'm going to uh, try to convey apply more generally and paint a political economy of conflict. So, before I give you the reasons, let me talk about the state for a moment. A political economy of conflict is the flip side of the coin of a political economy of a state building. If I make this statement, I have to tell you what a state is and we have to agree on what a capable state is. And of course that would be a long argument, especially between academics, will be a never-ending argument. But I just need you to agree with me on two basic things. First, that a capable state has to provide public goods to broad cross-sections of the population. And that prime among these public goods, in particular, even defining for some, is law and order and security. In fact, many of you may be familiar with Max Weber's famous proposition that a state is an agent that monopolizes the legitimate use of violence in a territory. And if we think of the salience of this aspect, then we have to define what legitimate is. And that can take another discussion even longer than the previous one. And again, what I want you to take uh, or, to, or to assume in this talk is just think of uh, legitimacy in the democratic states as um, meaning that the ordinary citizens can control the state. They can make sure that the state don't abuse its power. Uh, and another way to put this is that a legitimate state is one that solves the fundamental dilemma of state power. Uh, which is basically that a state that is powerful enough to do good things is also powerful enough to do harm by making control and power complements. Because citizens can control that power, they know that they can put a check on it, they know that they can prevent abuses, then they are willing to vest the state with such power. Another way to put it is that this ideal type is a consensually strong state. People consent this type of power to be vested in the state. So, Having said this, we can rephrase the problem that I started with, like why do people want violence? Why is it that so many sectors I'm going to claim are okay with violence, embrace it, or at least don't mind it? We can rephrase it as who opposes or why do people oppose a consensually strong state? And I'm going to argue that in certain contexts many people do, and the talk is going to be about three broad sets of mechanisms. The first one is the public good trap. The second one is the existence of political rents 
and that's connected with the many, what I'm going to call the many dimensions problem. And the third one is what we call the vicious circle of clientelism and state weakness. So let me just jump in into these three sets of reasons, starting with the public good trap. The public good trap can be easily explained if you imagine a weak state, basically one that is providing public goods very poorly. There's a low uh, supply of public goods. If you are in a, situ in a situation of low provision of public goods, then one consequence that you are going to observe is that people who can privately provide those necessities and essential goods to themselves are going to make up for the lack of public goods available. And then you will have this private provision of public goods by people who can kind of do it on their own. Now, if people are already providing public goods for themselves, making up for the shortages that the state is not being able to, to cover, then there is a low demand for public goods because precisely people who have kind of the means to influence are not worried anymore because they have made up for these shortages. And they're not going to be demanding many public goods. They're not going to be asking the state, hey, I need you to, to offer these public goods because they already have satisfied the necessity. So that fits back into a low supply of public goods because the state is not going to be forced into providing the public goods. So you have here a situation in which a low supply of public goods creates a low demand of public goods and vice versa. Now many of you have imagined already that this actually fits on and reproduces political and economic inequality. Why? Well, it fits on economic inequality because when there is a lack of provision of public goods, not everyone is going to be able to provide that necessity privately for him or, her or herself. But the people who have enough resources will. And in particular, where there's high economic inequality with cheap labor, it's very likely that the well-off are going to be able to do it and the not so well-off are not going to be able to do it. So this is going to exacerbate inequality because some people are going to get those essential necessities and others not. So it builds on economic inequality and it feeds back into economic inequality. Now, I would say more fundamentally, it feeds on and reproduces political inequality. Why and why more fundamentally? Basically because you could think of a situation of severe economic inequality, but perfect political equality, in which all voices are heard. Well, if all voices are heard, the people who were basically screwed up in the scheme that I was describing a, second, a few seconds ago and have no way to cover for the essential necessities because they cannot do it for themselves and the government is not providing them, they are going to be listened by the political system if we had a really representative political system. So it's in a sense more fundamental than economic inequality, the fact that political inequality is underneath or basically um, feeding into the system. And of course, it also reproduces political inequality to the extent that the asymmetric distribution of resources and opportunities basically creates differences in access to wealth, and access to wealth is also access to power and influence, so it reproduces political inequality. So this is the public good trap, and, and, and we can discuss several examples. Here is one, which is basically, again, from data from Colombia. If you think of public good provision in terms of education in Colombia, it's more or less universal at basic levels, but at very poor quality when it comes to public schooling. What happens? Well, anyone who has the means to do it will look for a private education hoping that it's better quality. That's exactly what you observe here. Lower income people in Colombia who are sending their kids to school, if they are sending them at all, nine out of ten are sending them to public schools. It only requires you for you to have a little more income. How much more income? Well, the income, here's this, the highest group of income that we can measure in this large panel survey that we run at Universidad Los Andes, but that's not even the richest people in Colombia because the richest people don't answer surveys in Colombia or anywhere else, right? But the richest people who would answer a survey, the ratio is exactly reversed. Nine out of 10 of their kids are going to private schools and only one to public school. This is probably a top quintile of the distribution. If you look at the top, that's out of the distribution, I would bet that it's almost universal private schooling uh, for these kids. So we see here people who can satisfy kind of the lacking of public goods privately, they would do so, but those who cannot will not, and this basically exacerbates and creates the circle that I was referring to before. Another example is when the government doesn't provide security. 
when the government doesn't provide security, you would have characters like the one on the left in the slide in Colombia, which is basically a watchman, it's traduced as watchman, literally in Colombia, and the watchman or security guard is a very common character in Colombia, so much so that here he, it's being played by a famous comedian, and every apartment building in Colombia would have a security guard. We are filled with gated communities and so on. We are used to the fact that, well, if the government doesn't provide security, we'll provide it for ourselves, and we have security guards all around. Now, the left, the guy on the left is the not so bad kind of private provision of security. This guy, this specific guy, this comedian, was killed by the guys on the right. The guys on the right are paramilitaries, self-defense groups that emerged partly as a result of guerrilla groups in Colombia starting to kidnap wealthy landowners to finance their operations. Some of those wealthy landowners, also drug dealers themselves, who decided to set up these self-defense groups. And these self-defense groups, of course, gave security to these landowners, but they gave insecurity to everyone else. You know? So this is another example, a particularly bad one for the creation of a functional state of how the public good trap can create many problems. Now, this paramilitary case also forces you to think of whether when this happens generally in society, you start to have a kind of a certain type of paramilitary culture. You start to get used that, you know, we cannot rely on the law and order on institutions to basically function and do what it should. We have to fend for ourselves, right? And I thought about this six years ago when after six years of living in the US doing my PhD, I arrived to live in Colombia and I found that many people in apartment buildings would just blast their stereos every night and you would go to them and very naively say, but look, there's this rule here in the apartment building rules and it says that you shouldn't be playing this loud at this time. And actually there's also a law and the law also says that you shouldn't be doing this at this time. And people would like, what are you talking about? They would say like, yeah, you know, but it's a party. Um, and so what do people do? Well, they can try to take justice into their own hands. And in fact, in surveys, if you ask Colombians relative to other people in the region, if they think that it's okay to take justice into their, into their own hands, more people than in other places would say, yeah, it's okay to take justice into their own hands. I didn't try to take justice into my own hands, but I did start to look for more protective measures like soundproof windows. And actually, if you do a Google fight competition of soundproof windows for several countries from Latin America, Colombia stands first. I'm not surprised. No? So this can feed into a kind of culture, more generally, of people providing things privately for themselves, but that's terrible for the consolidation of a functional state where rules apply, norms apply, and it's not about people privately solving problems and about pacts, but about the law and about institutions. Another implication of the public good trap has to do with Colombia's exceptionalism in macroeconomic stability. One thing that macroeconomists always discuss is like, you know, Colombia never defaulted on its debt, not even in the 1980s when all Latin America was defaulting on its debt. Uh, and one question is, why has macroeconomic stability been provided so effectively? So the public good trap provides an answer, which is because it is the one public good that you cannot provide privately. So the elites in Colombia may be okay if the public education is not so great because they can have a private system of very high quality education. But there's little you can do privately to protect against a crazy exchange rate of hyperinflation. So that has to be functioning properly. So here's one conjecture why we have had macroeconomic instability in Colombia because unlike other shortages from the state, this shortage is one that the elite is not going to be very happy with. And by the way, this is just another reason why some may oppose peace building. Because peace building efforts normally require important social transformations and, and times of social transformation are times of uncertainty including economic uncertainty. It could also be times had it not been for the fact that we had excellent staff at the Ministry of Finance, it may also imply a fiscal burden, right? So that's the first reason, the public good trap. Second set of reasons have to do with political rents and the many dimensions problem. So what is this about? Many of you might have said, well, you know, an easier answer to the question that you posed of why people like violence is because there are groups that have economic rents from, from violence. And there are some that are obvious, you know, the arms industry, 
leaders of illegal economies like drug, illegal mining, smuggling, for whom having a state that is not functional, that doesn't provide law and order, is, is good. And these are people who basically enforce contracts via brute force and violence. So they are fine with that. Some other economic winners of violence are less obvious. For instance, those industries that, because they operate in an environment of violence, have barriers to entry uh, for their competitors, or are in an environment where regulation, for instance, environmental regulation is very loose. This is the case, and this has been documented very persuasively for the case of uh, Angola and diamond companies invested in Angola by Guillermo Ferrara. And you can think of many examples in Colombia and in other countries where companies are actually benefited from the disorder and disarray that violence brings to the whole set of institutions. But I think all these economic winners from from violence, of course, are part of the story why violence is so persistent, but, I, but again, I don't think it's the most important. I think the most important are those who derive political rents from violence. And why is this more important? Well, basically because politically powerful people shape society much more directly than economically powerful people. Of course, the two no, tend to result result economically powerful people people tend to be politically powerful politicians people, in Colombia. But not perfectly, and our at least politicians are and politicians and politicians and with people basically are shaping institutions on the So that the paramilitaries, so for, for in that sense, I think that for these those who derive political rents from violence are much more these politicians in that situation would derive economic that would be And um, what kind of political rents do we have from violence? So this is a word by the paramilitaries who presented large landowners' preferences, and they also were interested in not being treated too harshly by justice. came a uh, peace process with them. So what uh, Asimoglu, Robinson, and Santos do is basically very carefully document this symbiotic relationship between politicians and paramilitaries and basically show how that is very problematic for the consolidation of the monopoly of violence because as a politician you don't want to consolidate the monopoly of violence in some areas because if you do, you have to basically fight against paramilitaries who are ensuring that you get elected. So that's a political threat from political winners of violence to the consolidation of a capable state. Another set comes from this work also with Robinson, in this case with Ragnar Torbik and Juan Vargas, in what we call the need for enemies. So the existence of the benefits of enemies for politicians are well known, and for instance the case of the rally around the flag effects are very, very documented is this notion that when you have an external enemy, an external threat, then people rally around the flag, and if you take, for example, approval ratings for Bush, they basically had a peak every time there was an important terrorist attack or an important action against the external enemy. So that's one mechanism whereby violence gives a political rent to politicians. But the one that we emphasize in this paper is different. It's much more similar to the logic that underlies the auto mechanic. When you, when you take your car to a repair shop, the guy who takes the car faces the following dilemma. If I completely solve this problem, he's not going to be back. It's going to be solved. What if I solve it, but I keep it alive so that he has to come back here to still have me work a bit more in that annoying noise? Well, that kind of incentive is also one incentive that politicians can face. And perhaps no one put it more candidly, surprisingly candidly, than Newt Greenwich here discussing that one of the tragedies of the Bush administration is that they had been so successful at, at preventing terrorist attacks that people no longer felt that someone with a stronger stance against terrorism was needed and maybe they would vote for someone else. And he says, it's almost as if we should let every now and then a terrorist attack to happen. So what we do in this paper on the need for enemies is that we propose a model that explains this logic, and then we look at the behavior of the Colombian army under President Uribe, who was basically perceived as the auto mechanic that was the guy for the job of fighting the insurgency. And we find a behavior that is consistent with the behavior of an auto mechanic that is kind of doing a bit to solve your problem, but not completely, because if he goes away, you're not going to need him anymore. Another piece of research that I think speaks about this political rents problem is what we call the real winner scores. This is work with Kerubin, Ruiz, and Vargas. 
And here we basically build on a set of reforms that were implemented in Colombia in the late 80s and early 90s that implied an opening up of the political arena and the introduction for the first time of democracy at the local level to elect the chief of the executive power at the local level. Basically, municipal mayors were for the first time democratically elected since 1988 in Colombia, and a new constitution in 1991 opened the doors for new parties, most notably left-wing parties that had not been represented properly by the traditional parties into the political arena. And what that created is that, indeed, some left-wing parties got elected. And we observe in this research basically using, for those of you who are familiar, our regression discontinuity design, but the essence is comparing places where the left was lucky enough to narrowly win to places where the left was unlucky enough to narrowly lose, and therefore places that are very similar in their type of political leanings, but very minor things determine that in one type of place the left won and in another type of place the left lost. And we compare these two places to see what happens with paramilitary violence. And we find that this is what the graph is showing to the right of each one of the thresholds. The right is narrowly win, the left is narrowly lost. Is an increase in paramilitary violence against the population and leaders and so on in municipalities where the left narrowly wins. What this is telling us, and we have a number of complementary results in the paper that speak to this, is something that I think is very telling for the discussion today because it speaks of the difficulty to build a consensual state. Essentially, when one dimension gets better, and one dimension did get better in the early 1990s in Colombia by providing local democracy, remember, that gives control to the citizens that's good for building a consensual state. But another dimension remained weak. Basically, there was no security guaranteed in different parts of the... country, what we saw is that the politically powerful, in this case, these paramilitaries that I talked to you about, and so and instead of having in interest, something resembling a lot of democracy, we ended up something to to more like a local authoritarian regime, the dimension of giving violence. Local democracy. Why did and that's the many dimensions. Because so all these attacks, what they basically when there are many dimensions, you advance on one, wing leaders, leaders, other remains and continue the political powerful and going to try to take another left and weak spot. You can call this the real political arbitrage effect, which is basically trying to make gains out of the weak spots. And I have another example from other piece of research of this many dimensions problem. It comes from the phenomenon of false positives in Colombia. This is a very innocent or nice sounding name for a horrible thing that happens in Colombia, which is basically killing civilians, the army killing civilians and presenting them as if they were guerrillas killed in combat. Why did this happen? Well, during the presidency of Álvaro Uribe, he made a conscious effort to try to fight the FARC more fiercely. Probably a good idea. But in the process of doing that, he introduced a number of incentives, formal and otherwise and informal, to army members that produced more killings. So you could expect to have monetary bonuses, promotions, days off, vacations, being sent to a nicer post if you provided more killings of guerrilla members. So we're making the army stronger and we gave them resources. But other dimension in this case, the judicial checks on the behavior of the military remained weak. And so the army basically colluded with judges uh, to set up scenes to make it look as if they had killed a guerrilla member when they had actually killed just basically a civilian. And we observe in this research with Asemoglu, Robinson, Romero, and Vargas, we observe a huge increase during this incentive period in the cases of false positives. These cases fell around 2008 when some cases were discovered very near Bogota. They were basically denounced by people in Congress, they were denounced by the media, and the UN Special Commission came to Colombia to fix this human rights abuse. The army took measures, the sentences were removed, and although it hasn't completely disappeared, it was strongly reduced. Why do we know that this happened? Basically because at the beginning they were very careless. They knew that they could set up the scenes with, with um, or at least with the complacency of some 
weak judicial institutions. And I have I know, I know little about armed combat, but I know that if you are in armed combat, you wouldn't put your grenades in those pockets like that where they can easily fall and you're going to be in peril. Other thing that shows that this is basically a civilian dressed up as if he was in conflict is that the boots, the left one is on the right foot and vice versa. Uh, the cartridge is on the boot, which is not a very accessible point to have it if you want to basically put your cartridge back into your gun to shoot. And one that I have no idea about is supposedly this guy is holding the trigger in a way that you would never hold the trigger. So we have plenty of evidence of this and we have plenty of evidence in the paper and from judicial investigations, journalist investigations, on how incentives played a role in this and how the weakness of the judiciary meant that these people thought they could get away with it. So that's the existence of political rents and the many dimension problem. Now finally, the third set of reasons has to do with the vicious circle of clientelism and state weakness. So in countries like Colombia, where the state is weak, political exchange is marked by clientelism. But the problem is that these two things reinforce each other. A weak state is the perfect ground for clientelism to flourish, and clientelism makes the state weaker. So what we do in this paper with Molina and Robinson is basically study this vicious circle. Now, before I tell you what we do, I have to basically define what clientelism is. And here we just follow the political science literature that emphasizes that clientelism is the exchange of targeted benefits contingent on some form of political support. Now, key to emphasizing this definition is that these benefits are particularistic, are benefits that can be delivered to a beneficiary, for example, to a voter in exchange for his vote, or his inner circle, and that these benefits can be given to supporters and withdrawn from opponents, right? It entails a quid pro quo, and some people like Susan Stokes has famously called this a system of perverse accountability, because it is not citizens who are holding politicians accountable to deliver on their promises, it is politicians who are holding citizens accountable to deliver on their support, right? Clientelism takes many forms. In the paper, we focus on clientelistic vote buying, the exchange of some kind of benefit to the voter in exchange for his vote. But we focus on this manifestation of clientelism because it's very key, it's very concrete, it can be asked in service and people are going to probably interpret it in the same way. But one thing that I must emphasize is that this is just one link in the set of clientelistic relationships that pervade a weak state. There is clientelism higher up in the food chain, if you, if you want, and probably is likely originated there. So for instance, there can be clientelism between the executive and the Congress. So the government is trying to pass a law, and the Congress says, okay, but I vote for you, but what's the benefit that I'm going to get? A mayor wants to have support for the next election, but then he can have a clientelistic relationship with a contractor. And he says, okay, I'll give you the contract, but what are you going to give me? They're going to give me some money for my next campaign. So these kind of clientelistic relationships go and occur in many other instances other than the one that we are measuring here. So we are going to measure one for simplicity, but bear in mind it happen this happens at several levels. Now, if we want to measure these two relationships, then we have to measure state capacity. How can we measure state capacity? We argue that a particularly good measure is tax evasion. Why? Because basically... Tax evasion has to do with the state's enforcement ability and his capacity to mobilize resources, but it also has to do with the general trust in the, in the state and the consent with the implicit social contract, and I consent to pay those taxes. So it has to do, in other words, with the type of consensual strength that I have been focusing on in this talk, right? So we attempt to measure clientelistic vote buying and we attempt to measure tax evasion. Now, it's likely that if I go around asking people, hey, did you sell your vote? Hey, did you not pay your taxes? People are going to say, no, of course, I've never sold my vote. Oh, no, 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 I always pay my taxes, right? So we have to be careful with this. We couldn't ask people directly about this. So we use a method that is called list experiments, which basically what it does is it protects the respondent from revealing explicitly his sensitive behavior. So what you have to do, for instance, in the case here of clientelistic vote buying, you would have a bunch of respondents 
of respondents, and you would randomly select some of them to answer the following question. What did you take into account when voting? And I don't want you to tell me which things you took into account. Just count them and tell me how many. So the person is assured that she is not actually revealing specifically what was done, only how many things were done. And to some of the people, you confront them with the list on the left, which basically includes gifts as one of the reasons why they voted the way they did. So it includes vote buying. Now another group received the same question and almost the same list, only that it doesn't have vote buying. Since it doesn't have these gifts as one of the reasons to vote for, then the only difference that you could observe in the average incidence of things between the left and the right is the amount of people who are selling the votes. In this example, the people who were confronted with the least in the left did on average 1.75 of these things. The people on the right did on average 1.59 of these things. The difference, 0.16, implies that 16% of the people are selling their votes. We can do the same with tax evasion. So very few people pay taxes in Colombia, and if it comes to income taxes, even worse. So we have to focus on the VAT, which is something that you pay every time you make a purchase of a good or service. And so it's familiar to everyone, but it's also familiar to everyone that if you say, you know what, don't give me a receipt so that we don't have to pay the VAT, then you avoid the VAT. So it's common to evade it. So we ask people, don't tell me which things you do, just tell me how many you do to try to save some money on your purchases. Some people got a list in which not paying the VAT was an option, other people got a list where not paying a VAT was not in there. The difference is the incidence of VAT evasion, and we find actually very similar numbers. How do the results look? Basically, this table shows them, uh, this figure shows them, and you see in clientelism, that about 16% of the people when asked with the list, which is these first dashed lines on the left, are selling their votes. Now what we did is we also received part of the sample, also randomly selected, to ask them directly, to see what they responded when they were asked directly. And guess what? They responded the same. So it implies that people were not ashamed to recognize, just at the same rate as they recognize it indirectly, that they sell their votes. So it's not only that clientelism in Colombia is highly prevalent, there's nothing wrong with it in the eyes of people. They are willing, just as willing to admit to it indirectly or directly. So the difference between those two, which is the one marked with a triangle, is close to zero and is not statistically significant. So it is basically telling us that the extent of shame associated with selling your vote is basically non-existent. What happens when we do the VAT? It looks as if I hadn't changed the graph, but I have. We found almost exactly the same incidence and almost exactly the same pattern of no social desirability bias, no shame associated with not paying your taxes. I guess the best way that it has been put is by people in the coast in Colombia who say, esa vaina del no pegó, which means, you know, that VAT thing here, it didn't, it didn't catch on. It's not something we do, right? And that's kind of okay for, for Colombians. Now, if we want to argue that these two things are embedded in a vicious circle, then wherever there is more tax evasion, there should be more clientelism and vice versa. And this is the only regression table that I'm showing you in this talk. It is basically, don't worry about the different specifications, but basically we're trying to verify if there is a correlation between these two phenomena and if it's robust, and the answer is yes, it exists, and it's very robust and very statistically significant. There's nothing that we can do to try to make this correlation disappear, it seems very robustly that individuals who are more involved in clientelism are also individuals who are more involved in tax evasion. Now, why does this happen? What are the mechanisms, what are the reasons that a weak state makes clientelism flourish and clientelism makes a weak state more likely? Well, we identify seven mechanisms, and we call them the seven sins. And in the paper, we discuss the seven mechanisms and show a bunch of complementary evidence. I don't want to spend my time here showing you all the complementary evidence. So what I'm going to do is basically state what each one of the sins is, and then share anecdotal evidence from, for a few of them. So, the first thing is that clientelistic parties want to preserve their comparative advantage. 
Clientelistic parties are good at delivering particularistic gifts. They are good at establishing an individual relationship with someone, giving them something, and getting some political exchange in support. That's exactly the opposite from public good provision. You get it because it's a public good and you're entitled to it. So if there's a lot of public good provision, people are not going to depend on these little favors that politicians give them, and these politicians are going to lose their edge, they're going to lose their comparative advantage. So clientelistic parties are really opposed to building a capable state, one that is able to provide public goods because they lose their comparative advantage. And we have done research not only in Colombia on this, but we have also done research in Mexico where the PRI is kept perhaps one of the stereotypical clientelistic parties throughout the 20th century, and we have found consistently that these parties try to block the efforts to build a more capable state in terms of building capacity to deliver public goods. Second and third scenes have to do with the fact that clientelism operates at a very personal level, at establishing a personal relationship between the person who gives the favor and the person who gives the political support. So it all depends on deals and pacts and on law and the norm. What implication does this have? So one, is essentially that it displaces formal relationship with the state. Instead of you thinking that there's a right that you're entitled to and that you should control the state, remember, control the state to get power from the state, that complementarity that we have to have in a consensual state for the state to be more powerful just doesn't happen here. Because you just get your little favor from a particular connection that you have, but you don't use institutional challenge to make the state responsive. Moreover, and this is the third sin, is basically that everyone cares about its little piece. So everyone is fragmented, and they don't act collectively. And when collective action suffers, then this collective action on the state for the state to be responsive is going to be very weak. The fourth and the fifth sins have to do with breaking the social contract. So one way in which the social contract is broken in a situation of clientelism is that everyone is mutually justified on defaulting on the social contract. If a politician comes to me and tells me that if I vote for him, I get some money, immediately I know, well, this politician is not doing his part. If he's willing to pay some money to get himself elected, he's probably going to get some rents out of office. And so he's not going to be in the office mainly for the public good, but he's going to be in the office to get some private benefit. And if he's cheating, why shouldn't I cheat? I can avoid my taxes, everyone is cheater here, that's fine. So we have the situation in which the rule, the culture of saying the law is something that we should abide by is not such. And hence the surprise when people were confronted by me in apartment building saying, you know, there's a law. They said, like, a what? There's a law that says that you cannot do this noise. Well, it didn't make sense to them. It honestly didn't make sense to them. Another way in which we break the social contract is that we undermine the role of elections and of other institutions for oversight. The idea of elections is that you basically elect someone, you see if that someone delivers on the promises, and if the, the person does not deliver on the promises, you basically complain, and you at least don't vote for that party and for that person again in the future. But if everything that's happening is that you vote for the person, you get your tiny little gift, then you forget what the person is doing in office. He can do what he wants, I already got my part. And that also applies to other institutions of oversight. Because basically, many of these exchanges are either illegal or borderline gray in a way that opacity is very good because we can make this deal and hopefully nobody will notice. So we are actually all in for promoting opacity and basically going against transparency. The sixth thing is basically that powerful groups and not citizens are going to be capturing the state. All of the scenes that I've mentioned before, many of them, point in the direction of the citizens, ordinary citizens, not being able to control the state to make sure that it's accountable, to make sure that it doesn't abuse the power. And if the citizens are not doing that, then someone else is going to sneak in. Who? Special interests are willing to pay legislators to get some favor legislators or uh, mayors to get some contracts and so on. It could also be, these power groups could also be government employees who are not selected on merit, like the ideal Bavarian bureaucracy, <laughs> but they are selected based on which political support they decided to give. And if these powerful groups and not citizens control the state, then we have 
again, a problem in which we are not building a state that is consensually strong. The final reason is an idea on why, or basically, if you think of all these societies, highly unequal, with very weak institutions, uh, with things depending on pacts and non norms and laws, the extent of control by powerful elites of society depend on the tools that they have at their disposal. And they could choose different tools. Clientelism is one particularly cheap tool to control society. You just have to give some tiny little gifts and you're done. An alternative of control is populism that is also used sometimes by elites. But at least populism has the advantage, or I don't know if the disadvantage in that case, that you have to have a large state. You have to give large handouts. And so this is an idea that is actually explored also by Jim Robinson when discussing whether Colombia is such an exceptional Latin American country given its macroeconomic stability. He says, well, it's not so exceptional. It's the same as others. It only chose clientelism over populism. But it's not that exceptional. So these are the six sins. As I said in the paper, we discuss a bunch of complementary evidence that is consistent with this that I would love to share with you, but it takes a lot of time. So let me, instead of getting into the regressions and the correlations, tell you a few anecdotes of some of the sins. So the first anecdote comes from sin number three, which is this idea of fragmenting society. There are some recent protests by indigenous groups in Colombia, and the government was just able to kind of cope with these protests by dividing, by fragmenting the indigenous groups, making little promises to different ones, and being able to handle the strike that way. Now, the government wasn't so smart at this at the beginning. We had in 2013 what was called the agrarian strike. And President Santos was famous for saying when the agrarian strike was in place, el tal paro agrario no existe, meaning like that so-called national agrarian strike does not exist. Well, it turns out it did exist. Why was Santos so confident? Because he was used to these strikes. You would have different dignities, the, the potato dignity, the arracacha dignity, the different dignities of different produce in different parts of the country. And they would always work in this very clientelistic fashion, very fragmented, looking for their benefit, something to get out of the government and stop the strike. This time there was the national agrarian strike. And President Sansu didn't believe in that because he was used to, oh no, you know, these are different strikes that we just have to bargain something out and that's it. Well, it turns out that this time they were really nationally organized and it did exist. So, of course, cartoonists made fun of Santos. Uh, here's one in which Santos is all confused and, and he's saying, like, strike, what strike? And the peasant is saying, president, which president? And the one on the right is basically, Santos is known to be a golf player. And so there's a peasant there. He has a legend that says, national agrarian strike. And the caddy is telling the peasant, you should have some patience. The only fields this guy knows are the golf fields. So I think this speaks of what we're used to in Colombia in terms of how collective action operates. This was a big surprise that we had a national effort of collective action. Another anecdote from a sin is this justification in defaulting on our obligations. Because you are defaulting, I can default. So in the contest for mayor of Bogota, Candidates Antanas Mokus and candidate Samuel Moreno were facing in a debate. And so candidate Antanas Mokus asks candidate Moreno, if you could buy 50 votes and thus avoid the victory from a candidate who, vote, who bought 50,000 votes, would you do it? And candidate Moreno basically says, oh yes, no doubt. And you should see the video, you look it up. What happened? Moreno won. He was willing to buy the votes, so, you know, Antanas wasn't willing to buy the votes. Moreno won. What happened then? He became the champion of clientelism with government contractors in the so-called contract cartel. And he's currently in prison. So, that's the parable of Moreno. Scene number six spoke of the fact that powerful interests will step in and control the state if citizens don't. So, these powerful interests can be groups that block legislation affecting them, like, for example, people trying to avoid a tax reform or regulation, public employees who are political appointees, as I said before, contractors who benefit from public resources, as has been the case in Latin America with the Odebrecht scandal that some of you may be familiar with. 
We have had two recent episodes of that. One is what was called the legislative extortion. Last night at 11.50 p.m., right before the session was closed, the Congress passed the legislation to ratify the transitional justice system that would apply for the peace process that was just signed with the FARC. Why did they wait until last minute and actually delay these months and months? Because they were getting bureaucracy out of the government as much as they could. Another example comes from the recent tax reform that Colombia had, in which, despite the efforts of some brave deputy minister of finance in Colombia, who was pushing for serious tax reform and making sure that we had reasonable taxes on the wealthiest people and on the wealthiest enterprises, and that we had a tax on sugar, which is kind of, it's great when economists can say we have here a tax that is both efficient and equitable. And that's really an, a kind of a miracle to discover something like that. And the solar tax was one of those, but not only the functionaries of the Ministry of Finance, but the people who tried to take on this cause were, had no chance against the special interests. And there's a recent story in the New York Times on this if you want to check it out. So in one slide, we have seen that many people do not like violence that much. That they cheer for it directly, or at least for a weak state with violence as one of the side effects. And we have seen three broad sets of mechanisms. The public good trap, the political rents and the many dimensions problem, which leads to what I call the real political arbitrage, and which speaks of the perils of investing in one dimension when other dimensions remain weak. And finally, the vicious circle of clientelism and state capacity itself involving seven sins. So, let me just go back now to the initial portrait that I painted of Colombia, of a conflict-ridden country that has suffered a lot from violence. What has happened in recent years? In recent years, partly resulting from a major peace process with the FARC, our main guerrilla group, and another one with the ELN, the second biggest guerrilla group, we have seen a reduction sustained in militaries killed in combat, in guerrilla members killed in combat, in landmines and explosives victims, in terrorist attacks, and I could go on and on with all the indicators that have improved as we try to solve this and arrive at a successful peace process. Now, despite this, many of you probably know, a plebiscite to ratify the initial terms of the peace agreements was rejected at the polls, animated by a very powerful opposition. And the president who pushed for this remarkable historic achievement, even if you don't like him for other reasons, is perhaps the most unpopular president of recent times. So maybe coming into this talk you would be surprised by this, but maybe now it's not so surprising. So what can we do to try to end on a positive note? Well, first thing, do not expect miracles. What I have shown here are deeply embedded political equilibria with many reinforcing feedback loops. But if you want room for optimism, and, and, and you must work on many dimensions at the same time if you want things to work well. But if you want room for hope, there is a version that is virtuous of each one of these feedback loops that I emphasized. If you manage to make the state stronger, maybe you will hit clientelism hard, and if clientelism suffers, the state is going to become stronger. If you are able to provide more public goods, you are going to have less people having to rely from them privately, and you are going to break the cycle of increasing economic and political inequality, and you might have more demand for public goods and get into a positive loop. And you see some aspects of that happening in Colombia as well. I didn't emphasize those today, but there are. And you see that in other countries too. And the final thing that I think it's very apt to say in this audience is that leadership matters. If someone should hear that, is Harris Public Policy students. So, thank you. Finish with that. Thank you.